Okay, so we're recording at this point on. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that if, again, if you're new to Zoom, some of you who use Zoom all day know this, of course, already, but there's a gallery view and a speaker view. And you can choose between those as you like. But again, when you move your mouse in the top right corner this time, there'll be an option for speaker view or gallery view. And when you click on that, you'll see the screen change and you can select whichever option is most enjoyable for you. I think those were my major tips right now today. Uh, the plan for this evening is to have Joanne give us um, kind of some, some basics, some foundational information um, in about 10-ish minutes. So we have a basic understanding of what cross-pollinating and open pollinating and what those things mean. And then we'll get into some videos that we recorded at Ritz Cellar Gardens, which is Evelisa's uh, business and farm. And so we'll uh, share those and then do a clip, share a little bit more about it, do a clip, share a little bit back and forth that, that way. So if you have questions as we go, please feel free to add those in the chat box. Also feel free to write down notes and ask them at the end. We are planning to keep um, hopefully at least 15 minutes at the end for questions. So we should have time for to answer things you're wondering about. I think those are my logistics that I wanted to run through. So Evelisa and Joanne, do you just want to introduce yourselves quickly? Evelisa maybe first and then Joanne and then Joanne, you can just continue on and share your intro. Sure, so I'm Evelisa and I have a small market garden um, where I grow vegetables, mostly for storage. And I also grow and save seed. And the seed, seed I grow, I use in my garden and I also make available through Superior Seed Producers. So I'm a member of Superior Seed Producers as well. And my introduction to seed saving came through persuasion from Joanne. Um, and I think it was maybe just six or seven years ago. So haven't been doing it for that long. I'm still learning tons, tons about it every year. Is it my turn? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Am I, oh, I'm up. Okay. I, <laughs> I don't know what I'm looking at here. This is bizarre. Okay. My name is Joanne and I have been saving seed for probably longer than I care to remember, maybe about 40 years or so. And I started doing that um, out of frustration. We eventually, uh, we moved to Thunder Bay and a group of us got together. We were called the 2B Seed Savers. It was kind of like to be or not to be. And it was a play on the zone that we were in or not in at the time. And through Seeds of Diversity Canada and the Bauta uh, family, we were approached to see if we would be interested in receiving more education about saving seeds. And I think that's probably about the time that Ev became involved. A few people jumped on board because we just couldn't pass up this opportunity. And so we've been learning how to save seeds ever since then. Um, I may have been saving seeds for a long time, but I've learned just about everything in the last, you know, amount of time that we've been with, uh, with Bauta. So yeah. And we're both members of Superior Seed Producers. So that's what came out of this training education thing that, that we had. So I guess I'll start. And my portion, um, as Rachel said, is to kind of re revisit what Lucy said at um, an earlier webinar in the spring about planting your own seeds or planting your own garden and kind of um, elaborate on that a little bit and take it a little bit further. The first thing though that I would like to say is, wow, it has been a summer for growing. I hope all of you have had some success in your gardens because the last time a lot of us talked was when everybody was planting their gardens and now the gardens are coming in. So um, I hope there have been successes everywhere and for everyone. The first thing I'm going to mention, and a lot of this is probably hopefully what you knew when you're planting your garden or, or what you hope you knew, but we're doing that little bit of a recap. And one of them is at this point in particular, it's really important that you label everything that you have. And you'll see some of this a little bit later on in the videos, 
um, where we do have to label because a lot of the seeds, tomato seeds look the same, pea and bean seeds look the same. Once they get mixed up, that's it. You don't really know what you have until you plant them out again. Um, some people use markers for the rows. Some people like Ev use great big sticks that it's impossible for little kids to pull out. Um, and even if you trip over them, the stick stays put. So just label everything right from the get go. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is show you this. Um, I hope Rachel, did you manage to share that or is it online? This is the reference guide from Seeds of Diversity Canada. And I use this all the time. And I just want you to know that I'm going to kind of following the order of the columns in this so that uh, I can keep track of what I'm talking about. So what, what you hopefully know or knew when you planned your garden was choosing the varieties that you're going to grow. Uh, the first thing is to choose open pollinated plants versus hybrid plants. And the idea behind this is that um, with open pollinated seeds, you know that they, the seeds that you get or the, the product that you get is going to be the same as the parents uh, that were planted. They are basically, um, what they call true or stable varieties, whereas hybrids are the result of crossing of two different varieties or two different, um, the same species, but two different um, plants, types of plants with different characteristics. And so you will come up with something that um, looks completely different. So you plant the hybrid seed, but because they have different parents, because the, the genes have been mixed, um, you have no idea what's going to be expressed in the seed that you save and you have no idea what your plants will look like the next year. With open pollinated seed, you can save that seed and reliably get uh, what you planted the next year. So that's one of the reasons for saving open pollinated seeds. There are many others, but I won't go into that. The others that you want to choose, especially where we are, um, a short season seed, uh, a short season variety. And Lucy mentioned this when she was talking about her different varieties of corn, planting an early corn and a late corn. If you're trying to save seed, you want to plant a variety that is as early as possible without sacrificing the qualities that you want in that crop. Um, as an example, I grow Dorini corn for superior seed producers and I started harvesting my corn on August the 14th, but the corn, the cobs I have flagged that are staying in the garden will be there at least to mid-September and possibly even later if the weather holds. So that means that they, are be, they will be in the garden for a good month longer. So if I chose something that matured um, in September, good chance would be that um, they would either have a severe frost or we'd have so much rain that they would rot or birds would get them before I could save the seed. So choose short season varieties if you can. Um, the way to look at this, if you're looking at a seed packet is the DTM or days to maturity on the packet. Um, some of those vegetables, some vegetables can be ripened indoors if they don't ripen on the vine or outside and tomatoes are an example of that. Some do not ripen indoors well at all. So be aware of that. The easiest seeds to save and you want to choose the easiest for your first time around um, are ones that are what they call selfers. Uh, they are self-pollinating. And if you look at the chart, the quick reference guide, you'll see difficulty and then pollination after that. And for most of the easy seeds, they are self-pollinated, which means that the plant or the flower is a complete or perfect flower, having the male and female parts of the plant contained within the flower. And with some, such as beans and peas and largely tomatoes, the flower is completely closed so, no, so that no other pollen can get into the flower. So you're, you're pretty well ensured that 
the pollination is going to be from its own, from itself. And so that you're going to be breeding true. With some, um, you might have a perfect flower with male and female parts on it. But if the flower itself is open to insects, um, insects can get in and cross pollinate. So that presents a bit of a problem. So the main ones that we will look at are beans, peas, lettuce, and tomatoes. And they are um, considered to be easy and pollination is self-pollinating. The other kind of pollination are ones that are called crossers. And that means that either um, an insect or wind uh, will be pollinating the plants for you. And I won't go into detail about that, um, but they are considered to be more difficult to save seed from. And don't save seed from everything in sight because you're just gonna be overwhelmed. So choose some of your one or two of your favorite varieties. Having put in your garden and maybe not knowing um, what some of the requirements are for seed saving, um, take a look at this chart and select what will best fit your garden. Pretty well guaranteed there's gonna be something in there that has um, all the, that fits the criteria needed for saving seeds, okay? Some of them may not, like some of the squashes, but like I said, beans and peas and lettuce and tomatoes should be fine. All of these are annual plants, vegetables. Um, there's between annuals and biennials is that annuals will um, produce, grow and produce their fruit the first year and their seed. And biennials take two years. They have a vegetative year the first year. They have to be overwintered in a root cellar um, or cold space and planted out the next year to produce seeds. So there is a lot more involved in that. Um, so please, it's just as well to stick with your annuals and when you're all excited and you can you know, successfully save your seed this year, then you can start reading about biennials over the winter and get ready for that. Um, isolation distances. It suggests uh, in the chart, um, can you just move it up a little bit, Rachel, so we can get to the top maybe? I think it says uh, isolation distances is the next line here. And it says community versus commercial. We aren't commercial. If you look at commercial, the distances are very much larger than that for community because of the fact that the seeds are being sold. But if you look at the first part of the line and take a look at some of these, for instance, um, where are we in here? Three meters, beans, mung beans, lima beans are a little bit different. Runner beans, 200 meters, that's because they're insect pollinated. Beans, soybeans, self-pollinating, three meters. That's not very far away. You know, so the distances are very close. If you have them on either side of the garden, um, you'll have no trouble um, getting seed that's relatively pure. And, and the whole idea of this, it does vary um, with the way that your gardens are set up. And Ev will talk about that a little bit when she's doing her bit and some of it is um, also talked about in the videos and that there are ways that you can get around isolation distances you know it through time distance barriers or whatever but she'll talk about that so just take a look at that um, and minimum population size if you i'm just going to jump over to the column uh second from the right and for these sulfurs again the minimum populations are very small you don't need very many plants. Um, and that is because they pollinate themselves. They don't rely on other plants for the genetic diversity that's required or to uh, maintain a healthy population. Um, others that are considered to be more advanced or intermediate, um, larger populations are required. For instance, anything that's wind pollinated. So. In, a, in your first garden, um, definitely with beans and peas and lettuce, you will have enough plants to have the minimum number of plants. Minimum number of plants um, has to do with trying to maintain genetic diversity uh, in our populations of plants. 
if we are wanting to have as much resilience in our plants as possible for whatever adverse situations arise, such as um, a drought or rain or early, I mean a drought or excess rain or an early frost, um, any kind of climate um, crisis, then we want to have as many genes, as much genetic variability, a variability as possible in our population so that there will be some plants that will survive. So that's why we look for um, a minimum number of plants. You might not have that minimum number and some gardeners, what they will do is they will continue saving seeds until maybe a few years later they find that their populations are, their seeds are not maintaining the vigor that they had at the beginning and then they will look to other plants or look um, to other sources to buy new plants or to buy new seeds, sorry. Um, lastly, we're going to go on to the next little bit and that is course grow varieties that you like because you're going to be growing in most cases a few more plants than what you normally would grow in your garden if you have the space for it. Um, so you might be eating a lot of what you're growing. And as far as seeds, what seeds do you want to save out of that population that you're growing? Save seeds from your best looking and healthiest plants. Ones that mature that you want, the earliest maturing ones within reason because you want to continue, um, you want to save that trait. Look for characteristics that that plant should have. So for instance, if you are growing up a green potted pea but you find pods that are purple, don't save seeds from the purple potted ones. Um, lettuce seeds. If you're saving lettuce, you know that the lettuce that you planted is a white seeded variety and you happen to have black seeds in the mix, don't separate out those black seeds. Um, the tomatoes and cucumbers, um, you can always, and you know, when you get into overwintering um, vegetables such as carrots, you can taste the fruit, taste it. There's no point in saving seed from a bitter tomato or a bitter cuke. Um, so, and sometimes that just happens, whether it's a mutation or whatever it is that gets into your crop, you know, they, it will happen. So, so check your seeds, like taste, taste the fruit before you save the seed. Um, one of the hints is to never plant all of your own seed, all of your seed for that year. Part of that is because you want to have something in reserve. Part of it is that you want to have some seeds to refer back to when you're saving your seed. For instance, was your lettuce seed white or was it black? You know, it, it really helps to have the seed itself to look at. Um, don't save seed from diseased or moldy plants. Um, you will, many of these diseases are carried over onto the seed, um, whether it's on the seed coat um, and needs to be washed off it's just not a good practice to save seed from diseased plants. For saving seed in your garden, you would want to choose, um, people do it several different ways. Some people pick all of the seeds that they want, uh, um, I mean, sorry, all of the peas, for instance, and beans that they want, and then save the rest. Other people will set aside a portion of the garden, a portion of the row, say a quarter of the row or whatever and you just save seeds from that and that um, doing it that way is a lot more clear-cut and straightforward in the sense that you will be saving seeds throughout the season um, you will have managed to get some seeds that will ripen uh, earlier in the season that you can harvest if uh, and avoid some kind of weather catastrophe like an early frost or hail or something that will ruin the young fruit. So there's more than one way to save seed, uh, whatever works in your garden. Um, it will change a little bit if you start producing a lot of seed because you can easily set room aside. And I think maybe that's about it. 
um, the next part will be EVs, I think, for the harvesting and storage. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Joanne. That's great. Folks, if any of that raises questions for you, you can already start putting them in the chat and we'll just keep a list going for when we get to the end. Um, at this point, we'll switch over to showing some videos unless there was anything that you wanted to say quick before we started ever. Should we just jump into peas? I think we should just go to peas. Yeah. Yay, peas. Okay. Um, so just a heads up, folks, on our videos. Uh, they look beautiful on my end. And depending on your internet, they might look beautiful on your end too. We've tested it many ways and the audio should come through great for everybody, uh, but the video might be a little bit jumpy uh, depending on your internet connection. So we apologize for that, but at this point, this is as, as good as we can get it today. We do plan on posting each of these videos individually on YouTube, so they will be available to watch later um, at your own pace and time. Um, if it does look though, if it is, uh, terrible quality that you can't even learn from it, please send me a chat uh, and we'll pause it and we can do a, a different approach. But we think uh, it'll still be uh, helpful to learning. So we'll start with peas and see how that video goes here. Okay, it should be sharing at this point. I'm gonna hit play. If it doesn't work, someone send me a chat. <laughs> So this is a bed of sugar snap peas, and the plants are kind of nearing the end of their life. I've been picking them for a few weeks now, and it's time to start thinking about saving seed off of them. So peas are uh, one of the crops that is a self-pollinating crop, and they're pretty easy. They're considered an easy crop to save seed from. Um, one of the reasons is this fact that they're self-pollinating, so you don't have to worry about isolation distances all that much and cross-pollinating with other varieties. What you grow, if you save that seed, is generally what you get. Um, so there's a number of ways you can do this. We have a lot of peas here, and so typically what happens is as the plants start producing less, I'm going to make sure I don't pick all the peas. I'll let them ripen. And then I'll just go along and I'll pull the bottom of the plants out. So I'll just uproot them and leave them if the weather's good enough. Uh, and by that, I basically, I guess I mean dry enough. I'll just leave them on the, on the fence or draped over the fence to finish drying and mature so that I can clean them. If it's really wet out and it's forecast for rain and it's super humid, I'll pull them into a dry space and just keep, keep them up and let them dry down there. And so a pea, that would be one that you could save seed from, would be a pea that looks, this one is actually really dry. Um, can I come to the camera? Yeah, you can. Okay, so here is an example of three peas at various stages. This um, beautiful green one I would eat, unless I wanted to save it for seed, then I would leave it on the plant and eventually it would get puffier and thicker. You would maybe be able to see the, the, the pea itself, like the shape of the pea. Um, it would get like alligator skin kind of thing and then eventually they'll start drying and shrinking down. And so the drier one is once you kind of can touch it and it feels crunchy and not soggy then you know that you're ready to clean your seed and that is your seed to clean and that's your, your pea seed. So these are kind of the three stages. Okay so these are some pea seeds that I pulled the plants out of the ground a week ago. I just put them in this hoop house to dry, keep the rain off, and they're super crunchy now, so they're ready for seed harvesting. Um, crunching is good, it makes it easier to get stuff out, and also you just know it's ready. And so if you have a small amount that you want to save seed from, like this entire amount, can you, mm -hmm. is um, one seed pack worth of seed. So on like a backyard scale, this might be a little bit more appropriate. Um, or just give you a good idea of what of what you might be getting yourself into. And then literally you can just come by afterwards and grab your peas and crunch the pods off and then you've got your peas and you can put them in a bucket and it's really as simple as that. And they're ready for next year.
All right, so thanks. Some of you sent me some chats that the audio is coming through okay, but there's a significant lag on the video. So apologies on that. I don't think we can fix it tonight. So um, we'll keep going um, with the videos that we have and hopefully it's showing you at least often enough chunks and pausing along the video that you can still get a sense for it. If not, let us know um, and that'll be great on the videos. But before we move on, Ev, anything you wanted to add there about peas or beans? Um, yeah, so I don't know what everybody else saw on their screens. I'm guessing it's probably like what I saw where at the end, you basically just saw the three peas in my hand. Um, so yeah, when you're, when you're saving for seed, you want to let things often most vegetables, you actually end up saving seed from something that's more mature than the stage you would want to eat it at. And, and so in that last kind of shot of the video, there was like the green pea that I would want to eat. And then kind of the puffy alligator skin pea that I wouldn't want to eat, but that was now mature enough or like fully mature. And then the last one was just a dry pea. And so you know generally that seed is ready to be harvested and cleaned when it's dry enough to just, well, for, for most of these ones that we're talking about right now, when it's dry enough to just kind of crunch it out of its pod. So for peas or beans, you would just let them dry if you can on the plants until they just crunch and crumble right, right out of their pods. Um, and then the one other thing that peas are great to do, or like a, peas are easy to do this with, is the concept of roguing, which is a really important part of seed saving. And roguing is basically just looking for the traits that you want in the plants that you're saving seed from. Um, and peas are great because you're, generally you're picking them all season. So you're, you're in there and you're looking at your plants and you're checking on them all the time. And so if you see that, oh, I'm picking peas off of these plants and they've got peas and little white flowers and then, oh, this plant has a purple flower, then you know that that's kind of an off trait and it's not reflecting all the things that the rest of the population is that maybe you want to pull that purple one out. Um, Roguing is actually probably the most interesting to me part of, of seed saving because it gives you the ability to, if you grow large enough populations, to adapt your, your seeds to your environment, to the stresses um, that they have, or you can work on just keeping it exactly the way it's always been for you. Um, I'm getting lost in all of the exciting things about roguing. But you can rogue for size, you can rogue for taste. So one neat way to rogue cucumbers to make sure that you don't save seed from bitter cucumbers because you're not going to cut open the cuke and eat it. But typically speaking, if you eat a young cucumber leaf off of a plant, if that leaf isn't bitter, then those cucumbers will not be bitter. But if the leaf is bitter, then the cucumbers from that plant will also be bitter. And so you maybe don't want to save, save, save seeds from that plant. Um, so any characteristic is something that you could rogue for or rogue against. We talk about in things like lettuce and radishes, the concept of bolting. So it makes its, it makes its fruit for such a short period of time and then it just races to go to seed. And that's, as somebody that wants to eat radishes, it's not really a desirable trait. So you would rogue against bolting. Um, yeah, so roguing is something that happens all season long. It happens at the beginning of the season for those like handful of straggler plants that come up late and kind of spindly after all the other ones have germinated and are, are well on their way. You're going to pull those stragglers out because you don't, I mean, unless you do, but typically you don't want to grow puny straggly um, vegetables or plants. So that's roguing. Joanne, do you want to add anything? No, except that I do agree that roguing is one of the most interesting aspects of of saving seed. Yeah, at first I thought it was kind of a chore, um, but then I realized just the incredible potential it has to help guide and change and adapt the plants and the seeds that I'm growing in the garden to be what I want them to be and what works for me and my garden and how I how I do things, what I like to eat, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So on to lettuce. Does that sound good? 
Okay. There's no audio right now, FYI. I'm in still in Ev's garden and we're going to talk about saving lettuce seeds today, which like peas and beans are very easy to save. Lettuce is considered easy. It is um, a self-pollinating plant, so you don't have to worry very much about it crossing with something else. Uh, it does produce seed in the first year. And if, like the beans that I was talking about, you can, if you have various varieties of lettuce, you can separate them by time, or you can basically just let them grow and see what you get, but they won't cross very easily. As most of you have already harvested your lettuce, um, you probably know that once it starts to get a tall stalk in the center, it's too far gone and the lettuce starts getting bitter. But you want to save some of those so that you can get seed. And some of you might have inadvertently found that as well. Don't pick the very first lettuce that starts to bolt to save for your seed because then you're selecting for lettuce that doesn't form a head. You're selecting for a lettuce that goes to flower. So this is really nice because you can eat your lettuce all summer long and save the very last ones to bolt for seed. So you get to have your lettuce and your seed. So you let it go for the summer and if you're lucky and you have a nice watered patch you'll get seed that looks you'll get a head that looks like this these are very similar to a miniature dandelion really and this little fluffy bit allows the seed to be dispersed lettuce doesn't really ripen all at the same time so you can go through your plant like this and leave them on the plant and just shake seeds off onto a piece of paper or into a bag or into a cup and in this case here, this is a black seeded lettuce and there's lots of seed right there. And you collect it from one plant, go to another plant maybe and knock some off this so that you get a bit more genetic diversity in your plants until you have enough seed for growing the next year. And that's it. And this is already dry. You can tell it's blowing off the paper. It's just a little bit of a breeze today. And that will be actually very easy to winnow and clean like that. Okay. And that's basically it. And you hardly need any plants because they are self-pollinating, like the beans and peas. You only need maybe six plants if you really want to maintain the genetic diversity. Great. Anything to add there, Ever Joanne? Well, Sounds good. Yeah, I just want to say um, when it comes to harvesting your seed, so Joanne made a good point, like the lettuce seed, it doesn't all mature at the same time. It's not all ready to harvest all at once typically, but if you just have a small garden or a handful of plants that you're saving seed from, you can just kind of get in the habit this time of year of just going through your garden every couple of days and harvesting whatever seeds are there and are ready. And so typically, again, those will be ones that are dry and that you can like crunch the pods of or that you can shake or tap off the plant um, and if you have a lot of seed like when I grow my sugar snap peas basically in in Thunder Bay area at least this time of year it starts to get get gray and wet and hard to dry big quantities of stuff outside and so I will just harvest the whole bunch of it pile it up somewhere warm and dry and harvest the seed off of it afterwards there so that it doesn't rot in the field. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, then we are going to do, just so people can sort of mentally prepare, we're going to do a video on flowers, specifically calendula, and then we're actually going to switch and do a wet seed on tomatoes. So another dry one here. Can I just add one more thing? Absolutely. Joanne started this evening, but with her giant roll of, of masking tape and talking about labeling. And so labeling when you plant things in the garden is really important, but labeling as you take things out of the garden is also hugely important at all stages as it moves through the process. That's all. If you feel like you're over labeling, you're doing it right. Is that the... Is that the exactly! <laughs> Excellent. All right. 
here we go. I don't think seed saving would be complete if we didn't mention flowers. And there's so many reasons that we grow flowers, partly for attracting pollinators, partly for our own pleasure, sometimes for medicinal purposes. There are many, many reasons. Fragrance is a lovely one. Anyway, something that I do grow a lot of, and so does Jeff, are calendulas. And they're very easy um, to save seeds from, as are several of the others that Ev has growing. Um, maybe Rachel can show a picture after of the Cosmos and the Satcher button, and there's some herbs like coriander that produce lovely flowers as well that are very easy to collect seeds. And here we have the calendula flowers. Here we have the flowers that are, oh, here's one that's just finished. And so the, you can rip it off the petals are finished. And now it's beginning to form the seed head. And as it gets closer, it starts changing color and becoming drier. And then it finally looks like this. Sometimes if you whack it hard enough, the seeds will just play fall out. I have to be a little bit careful about knowing which part of the seed and which part is the part that protects the seed. But they're very easy to collect the seeds from. And you can be collecting them throughout the summer. But you don't have to wait until fall. And they have crazy shapes. And I have been known to plant outside parts, think sometimes calendula and it's not, and there are the seeds in there. And then save them to plant the next year. Oops, they're blowing away. <laughs> and flower seeds are surprisingly easy. Many of the flowers that we have in those batch of far, um, farm flowers or homestead flowers are open pollinated and so they breed true with a little bit of variation. You can select for them if you want. Um, from here, for instance, I will select for pink cosmos rather than white. Doesn't mean I get all pink, but I start getting a predominance of pink ones. It covers, and sometimes some calendulas, they cover them pretty tightly. But you can see where this is like starting to... Yeah. All the way, and then this is the seed in here. Huh. And the seed is in the middle. Awesome. So some of that part didn't have actually any audio on it at the end there. So if you didn't hear anything, that's okay. Um, no, no extra audio there just for the visuals. But um, Ev and Joanne, anything you wanted to add there? So I just want to say that the I guess the three things we've looked at in the video so far, the peas, the lettuce, and the calendula are all examples of what are considered um, like dry seeds um, for harvesting and cleaning. So you harvest them when they're dry and you clean them and they are dry. And so the other kind of category of seeds would be wet seeded things. And those are things where the seeds are contained within the fruit. Um, and that would be like tomatoes or cucumbers, squash, zucchini, so that when you cut into the fruit and you scoop out the seeds, they're wet. And when you're wet, well, Joanne's going to show in the next video, um, she'll explain a bit about wet cleaning tomato seeds, but those are generally the two, the two categories of seeds. Um, wet seeds, once wet seeded things, once you are done kind of harvesting, scooping them out, cleaning them up, they also need to get dried for storage. And one in, like one, I think they say for storage of seeds, you want them to be 8% moisture, which I don't know how you would ever measure, except that it basically means if the pea cracks in, or shatters instead of smushes, um, or your seed breaks instead of kind of just mashes, then it's dry enough for storage. If it snaps instead of bends, then you're good. That's all great. All right, so let's do our tomato video. This one is about five minutes, just so you know it's a little bit longer, but um, some good visuals here and a couple of options. 
so far today, we've been talking about saving seeds, or I should say saving dry seeds. Uh, everything that we've taken from a plant so far has been something that we've been able to separate in our hands or like with the lettuce that just shook out of the plant. There are some seeds that um, require a bit more intensive work or just a bit more work to be able to save the seeds from them. And tomatoes are a good example. And tomatoes are actually a very easy plant to save seeds from. Uh, I think they're actually considered to be fairly easy. They don't cross very uh, readily with other plants as long as you maintain the isolation distance. But they are wet. So this particular variety, this particular one, um, is one of my own. It's called Small Round Black. I have no idea where it came from. I've been saving it for years. And it's one of the first ones that ripens in my garden. And what I do, I should mention, when I'm canning my tomatoes, I will often just take a slit like that. I'll take a taste of the tomato, and if I like the taste, I'll just squeeze out some seeds and use them for saving. And you can see that these are covered in kind of a gel. And that gel is actually a prevent, uh, prevents them from sprouting right away because if these fell off the plant in the fall and the conditions were right, the seeds would want to germinate and then with the cold weather coming, you wouldn't get any tomatoes. They would all freeze. So what we can do, when I'm canning, I will, preserving my tomatoes, I will take taste of several tomatoes and if they taste really good, I'll just squirt a bit in the jar and those will be the ones that I'll save the seed from for the next year. But you can also open them up and they have this beautiful jelly part in the middle. And if you're not saving lots of seeds like this and putting them in, and you can still use your tomato, just take all the seeds out that you want. You can take that pulp and use it for making tomato sauce or whatever. And these dark tomatoes make a really nice dark sauce. Take this and you can see the gel coming out, and you can just rub them on a piece of paper or on a, on a cloth. And you can rub the gel right off. You want to rinse them, but what you want to do is you want to physically separate the gel from the tomato, from the seed itself, because the gel really wants to stick. But you can see these have been separated. And then you can just rinse those seeds, now the gel is taken off, and dry them on a plate. So you don't have to use a very complicated method for trying to save the seed or extract the seed. But if you're doing a lot of tomatoes, this is great if you're just saving a few, but if you're doing a lot of tomatoes, you might want to try the fermentation method. And you just squirt it in however many you're going to be saving. And you can see they're in the this liquid in here and you can see the greenish they don't all look like they have green gel it depends on the color of the tomato that you're growing and you let that sit with a slight cover on it like that for several days until you see a little layer of mold forming on the top and that tells you that the mold has started to break down the gel from the seeds and the seeds will sink to the bottom and when you swish it the seeds will be very separate from, from the liquid. And that's as far as I'll go with trying to explain a wet extraction or extraction of wet seeds from dry. You can look at many online sources as well as how to save your own seeds from Seeds of Diversity Canada to get better instructions for that. But this is a very easy way to do it as well. Just rinse them off, dry them on a paper plate. Don't put them on a towel, paper towel, because they will be stuck there forever. Yeah, that's it. 
Awesome. So again, no audio there when the when the text and the pictures were up. So you didn't miss anything if you weren't hearing anything there. Um, yeah, anything on what seeds you wanted to add ever, Joanne, real quick before we hop to the next one? Uh, mostly I would say don't leave them. As soon as you can see that the gel and the and the seeds are separating, then it's time to rinse them uh, and dry them because the seeds will actually could drown. Um, they do need some air. So I have been known to, yes, I've left them in there for so long that everything died and I didn't know that until the next year. So um, yeah, that's one lesson I've learned quite painfully. And the mold actually comes from the air. So you don't want to close the jars too tightly. You want them to have access to air and you want some of the mold spores to be able to get in. And it's a normal decomposition process for, for the gel. Awesome, thanks. Um, so based on time folks, just so you know what we're planning here, um, we are happy to go 15 to 20 minutes over our planned um, ending time of eight o'clock. Um, we realize though you might have commitments that you need to get to at that time. Um, so feel free to leave when you need to. If you had any follow-up questions that you wanted us to answer, we would be happy to do that over email as well. So please feel free to email me. Um, you all have that in your inbox or send something in the chat. Um, but we did wanna show you a quick little one. Um, about beets. Um, I'm actually just going to pull up the video and pause in a, a picture so that you can see what um, the first year looks like versus the second year of beets. And then Ev, did you just want to do like a real quick overview of that one maybe when once it's up? Yeah, totally. Okay. Okay, share, click. Okay, so I'll just leave it paused here if you just want to point out what we're looking at real quickly. Okay, I can't see it yet though. Oh, sorry. Can you still not see it? I can still not see it. Can anybody else see it? I don't know, the Zoom's being very funny tonight. I also can't see anyone else's face. There it is. It's there, Rachel. Okay. Okay. So what you're looking at is Joanne next to a bed that I have planted kind of in the back half of the bed behind Joanne is beets going to seed and in front of her is beets being the beets that we all know and love to eat. And so beets are an example of a biennial crop which means they take two years to produce seed. So in the first year you would grow, you would plant your beet seed and you would grow beets as per normal and you would rogue out anything that you didn't like. And then when it came time to harvest, you would harvest and you would store over winter your favorite beets from the year before. And then the next year in the spring, you would come back and you would take these beets that you've stored all winter long and you would plant them out, which is what I did um, in the back of the bed where you now see them going to, to seed. And so those beets were planted in well, I guess the seed was planted in the spring of 2019, and then they were overwintered as beets all winter long. And then in the spring of 2020, I planted them out. And then this was just a couple weeks ago in the garden, and they are fully going to seed. And so most of the root crops that grow really well here are actually biennial seed crops. Um, it's just cool to see, because you generally don't get to see a beet um, producing seed and the same as same with like leeks and onions and carrots, parsnips, rutabaga. Um, and so just an interesting thing to consider if you are thinking of trying to save beet seed, you can grow as many varieties of beets as you want the first year when you're just growing the actual beets, so long as you label them right and you know which are which, because nothing's flowering and nothing's going to cross pollinate. It only matters isolation distances only matter the second year when things are going to flower and make seed. And so the second year you would probably just pick whichever beets store the best over the winter, you would plant those out. And the isolation distance on beets in a lot of perennials is pretty big, but a beautiful thing about it if you're living in town or you have neighbors or a smaller space is that typically nobody's growing beets for seed. So you can pretty much rest assured 
that your neighbors within the area um, are not going to have beets going to seed, and so you probably don't have to worry about cross pollination. Awesome. That's great. Um, and thank you to all of you telling me things in the chat. I appreciate that on what you can and can't see. Um, great. We have a 48-second uh, video about um, some learning with leaks really quick that we want to show you, and then we will switch entirely over to your questions. So if you want right. to... But I have to share the screen first. Ev, go ahead and tell me when you see it and then I'll press play. Okay. We might just sit here for 10 seconds. I see it. Okay. Right, okay. So we were just looking at the leak seeds and I was pointing out to Joanne and Rachel that there are so many examples of like, just how seed saving is this lifelong learning process. And you definitely don't need it to know it all to get started. You will never know it all. And so you should just start and this thing that I'm holding here is this is like insane. I'm not sure. It's a leak. It's a leak in its second year. It's making seed, but it's also making little leaks. And it's also making what looks like, um, I'm not sure if you can see this very well, yep. like bulbils, which are something that I normally think of as being what comes off of a garlic scape. And so this is like a winter's long learning project right here. And a great excuse to talk to other seed savers and each other and look online and just keep learning. Awesome. Um, so we did have a couple other videos, but we're just, we're not going to show them now. Everything will be posted to the internet at some point and those links will be sent to all of you because you registered for the webinar. So those will be available. It might take us about a week or so to get them all up, but rest assured that they will be posted and you will have access to them going forward. Um, we will start with this question from Caitlin about tomatoes, but in the meantime, folks, if you have additional questions, please throw them in the chat and we'll just work our way through them. Um, so Caitlin is asking, can you do a germination test after tomato seeds dry instead of waiting until you plant them out to find out the germination? Yeah, you're the germination person. Oh my gosh. I'm the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is totally a great time to germ test. So if you ever have seed and you don't know if it's viable, if it's going to grow the next year, you can do a germination test. And there's tons of information online about how to do that. And we maybe won't get too detailed, but after a seed dries is the time that you want to do it. I mean, it doesn't have to be right after. It can be months after. It can be years after. Um, but that is a great way to find out in advance if your seed is viable, if it's going to grow. Um, and saves you a lot of time and effort instead of planting all these seeds out into your little trays and then they don't do anything. Great. Awesome. We've got a question on the best way to save winter squash seeds. And then a following one, uh, which seems related because it's squash to me, drying zucchini for storage by spiralizing and hanging it to dry. Is there any reason I won't be able to use the seeds that are drying within the spiralized fruit of the zucchini? So two questions, one about winter squash and one about the spiralized zucchini. Um, I'll, <clears throat> I'll start Ev, and then you fill in. Sure. Um, the winter squash, I would leave it as long as possible. Um, the squash will be dry but sometimes the seeds aren't mature inside. So leave the squash as long as you can. Um, uh, probably, Joanne, sorry. sorry. Do you mean on the plant, leaving it on the plant as long as you can? Well, that leave it on the plant as long as you can, but when you bring it inside, don't try saving seed from it right away. Um, ideally, wait until you start eating the squash in the winter and the seed should be mature by then. But sometimes if you try to save seed too early, the seed, um, isn't ready. I also like to select for squash that's gonna last a long time in storage and so that just ties right in with what Joanne was saying in that I'm gonna save the seed from the last of my squash, the ones that lasted the longest, which will be well into the winter. Great. Thoughts about um, the zucchini? Yeah, as far as the zucchini goes, um, 
it ties in a little bit with the winter squash thing in that generally the eating stage of, or like the stage at which we would normally eat zucchini, the seeds probably aren't mature. Um, I just harvested a whole bunch of zucchini. They are more mature, but I'm still gonna let the seeds sit in there for a while before I harvest. So one way to know if it's mature is if you can't dent the skin of the squash or the zucchini with your fingernail, if it's too hard, then that is a good indication that it's, it's mature. So if your zucchini was that hard when you started um, spiralizing, then, then that bodes well for seed saving. I guess the other considerations are just if it's an open pollinated variety or a hybrid variety. And then also if it was properly isolated from any other um, types of squash in that family. So um, things that you wouldn't maybe think would cross with zucchini, but that do are things like delicata squash and pie pumpkins and spaghetti squash. Also other varieties of zucchini. Um, but if all, I mean, you can save the seed anyways. It just might not germinate and it might not make the same zucchinis next year. And that holds too uh, for the squash as well. Um, whatever squashes that you're saving, you have winter squash. I don't know if it's a Machata type or a Maxima type, but you don't want to be planting two different types of squash um, together because they will cross. Sorry, get that wrong, got it back, backwards. You want to, if you're gonna plant more than one variety of squash, so sorry, um, make sure that you plant not the same one. So it would be um, a Machada, which is a butternut type, Maxima, which is a Hubbard type, or the Pepo, which is the zucchini type or pie pumpkin. And you're pretty well, you're, the chance of them crossing will be very small, but if you have neighbors nearby that have planted the same kinds of squash, there's every possibility that you're going to be getting some crossing from your neighbor's squash as well. So you might not get, um, when you plant out your seeds next year, you might not get the same squash as you grew this year. So, And you won't know that until you plant the seeds next year. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, I, and it is eight. If you need to sign off, we understand. If you want to just hang out with us for a few more minutes to answer questions, that's also awesome. Uh, we have a question here from Andrea. Um, how about storing the seeds? How do you store them? What type of containers to use? A friend of hers has frozen them before. So just suggestions on storage options. Yeah, so I have, I store my seeds in old um, coffee bags, actually. Like not burlap sacks, but the ones like your one pound bag of coffee. So, but it just needs to be something that's airtight. Um, you wanna store them in stable conditions if you can, like fluctuations of humidity and temperature are hard on the seed. And there's like sort of a, a rule of thumb where if you add the relative humidity of the space that you're storing them in and the temperature in Fahrenheit, if that equals 100 or less, then they're in like a pretty happy place. So if the room is really hot and it's really humid, that's not a good combination for seeds. Um, so jars are a great way to store them also. Um, metal containers, heavy Ziploc bags. Um, I put all my bags of stored seed then in a, in a Tupperware with a lid on it. Um, and as far as freezing seeds, that is definitely something you can do for long term storage. I have never done that, but they just say that if you are going to do that, make sure that your seeds are dried to less than 8% moisture. Again, which is like a, a squash seed would snap instead of bend, a pea would crack instead of smush. Um, so if you get your seeds that dry, then they should be dry enough to freeze. Um, to add to what Eva said, <clears throat> sorry, if your seeds aren't completely dry when you freeze them, then the seeds will be destroyed because the water in the seed will form ice crystals, so it will, will kill the seeds. So that's um, one reason why you really want your seeds to be dry before you do that. But drying actually, I mean, sorry, freezing dried seeds actually prolongs the life of the seed um, considerably. 
And also when you're storing your seeds, make sure you label them. Pardon me? Oh, oh yes. Label them. For sure. <laughs> and even though it says in this quick reference guide, the longevity of the seeds, um, it's a really good idea to uh, do germination tests on them every year because sometimes the viability goes down quickly, uh, more quickly than you would think, depending on the storage conditions that you've used. Um, and if that, in that case, um, make a note that that's the year that you save seed from that plant again. Great. Um, with the time we have, no more questions have come in quite yet. If you still have more, please send them or feel free to email them to me and I can connect you with Ev and Joanne. Um, I was, it might actually, because of the crossing, it might actually be helpful to show the squash video real quick. You, you folks are all here, so I, I am guessing you might have a few more minutes. The squash video is actually quite interesting to consider ways that you can deal with trying to save seeds from two varieties in a smaller distance. Um, and so I think some folks might find that interesting since I, I know some of your names and I know some of you are gardening uh, in smaller areas and might not have that isolation distance, but isolation time. Um, are folks generally okay with that? Give me a thumbs up or a nod or a yes or okay, mm -hmm. Dan says yes. Thanks, Dan. I got two. Okay, two thumbs up. That counts. Three. Okay, here goes squash. Enjoy. Oh, wait. So, Ev, tell me when you can see it and then I'll press play. Okay, it's up, Rachel. Okay. Okay, so another really fun um, type of vegetable to save seed from is like the squash zucchini family. Um, it's really tempting. They get huge and beautiful. You can open there's tons of seeds. But it is a bit more difficult because of the whole cross-pollination thing. So one type of zucchini, say a yellow zucchini, will cross-pollinate with a green one, and then the next year, who knows what you're going to get. You might get some green zucchini, you might get some yellow zucchini, you might get some that are kind of bold, but it's not going to necessarily be exactly what you planted the year before. So squash and zucchini are trickier to save seed from because they need insects to pollinate themselves because they're, they have male and female plants. So somehow the pollen's got to get from one to the other. In the case of squash, zucchini, things in the cucurbit family, that is insects. And because insects will travel from here to there and from your yard to the neighbor's yard, carrying the pollen of your zucchini variety, they might land in your neighbor's yard with a different zucchini variety. You'll get zucchini, but the seeds might get all mixed up. And so if you want what you planted the year before, then you need isolation distances. You need to keep your plants far enough away from any other variety that it might mix with. And in the case of zucchinis and squash, it gets a little bit more complicated just in knowing now within the squash family there's three species and those within those species the different varieties will cross. So we have an example of that right where I'm standing. I've got some zucchinis growing here and behind me I have delicata squash. They are both the same species of squash. So they will cross pollinate. So left to their own devices with the bees and the wasps and all the pollinators, they're gonna get mixed up. And seed that I saved from this beautiful looking, obviously a zucchini, when I plant it out next year, I have no idea what I'm gonna get. It might be, it will be somewhere between a zucchini and a delicata in like this, this genetic melange. But I do want to save seed for my zucchinis. And so I don't have the isolation distance I need to make sure that one bee cannot get from one plant to the other. That is at minimum 400 meters. And that's a really long way. So one other way you can isolate is by time. So the way I did that here is this spring I planted out zucchini transplants. And I flagged, as you can see, the first zucchini off of every plant, and then every subsequent zucchini that came before the delicata squash that I planted from seed started blooming. And so by planting from transplant and planting from seed, I had two or three weeks of zucchini production before
before these guys started flowering, so I didn't have to worry about cross-pollinating. Once these started flowering, any zucchini that I would say seed from would be a genetic mix-up. But any one that I marked that started growing before the others flowered, I can be pretty sure that the seed will be the zucchini seed out. Okay, so hoping that was helpful to see time, isolation, options, um, the pictures at the end, hopefully you could see them long enough. Um, Ev had used some pink flagging tape to wrap around those zucchinis and also drawn on them with a the marker so that uh, she could mark which ones came out earlier. Um, yeah, great. Any last questions from folks? Throw them in the chat, let us know. Mull on them, send them tomorrow, send them in a month. We'll be here. <laughs> um, awesome. We thank you so much for attending. We hope this was helpful to you and future seed saving endeavors or ideas that you have. Um, Joanne and Ev are a fountain of knowledge when it comes to this and there's other folks in the area. I know we have folks joining us from the States and also from other parts of Canada today. So. Um, have a fun geographic range. So thank you, everybody. If you have feedback, please email it to me. And um, we hope you have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rachel. Of okay. course. See you, Joanne. See you. <laughs> Bye, Ev. Bye, Joanne. Bye, everyone. <laughs>